Uh, welcome to this milestone day. You know, our opportunity to engage with the rare disease congressional caucus members and staff persons on this most rare of all days, 22222. We'd like to thank each of the rare disease congressional caucus co chairs and their staffs. Senator Amy Klobuchar, Senator Roger Wicker, Representative G.K. Butterfield, and Representative Gus Villarakis. Um, I still remember going up to Congressman Waxman in August 2008 and chairman of the House Health Subcommittee and asking him if he would help me form a congressional caucus on rare diseases. And look, here we are today. Before we hear from these four, uh, before we hear from four people, the three congressional leaders on rare diseases, as well as my friend Eric Dubé, I'd like to make some opening remarks just as background on the accelerated approval pathway. When I was at FDA, the AIDS crisis erupted. No one saw it coming and it hit us head on, just like COVID has. FDA saw that AIDS may be, there may be a faster way to get new therapies to patients in dire need of treatments by approving them not on traditional basis of showing a clinical benefit like fewer AIDS hospitalizations or gaining weight because AIDS caused wasting or survival, but instead approving a therapy if it showed that the immune system was improved by showing an increase in the number of CD4 T cells. FDA and its creative genius and on its own initiative announced this new pathway to market accelerated approval. FDA said that a new drug treatment still needed to meet the congressional and statutory standard to show substantial evidence of effectiveness, but that did not need to be a showing that was a clinical benefit on how a patient felt or how a patient functioned or how a patient survived. Instead, for a serious condition where there's no therapies, this showing of substantial evidence of effectiveness could be on an endpoint that is, quote, reasonably likely to predict that clinical benefit. And the clinical benefit could be established later in longer post-approval clinical studies. I'm proud to have been part of that historic FDA team that created the accelerated approval pathway. And I'm elated to be part of today's historic panel exploring new ways to expand the use of this accelerated approval pathway to respond to the suffering of our sisters and brothers who are affected with rare diseases. You know, I happen to be visiting my 19 month old granddaughter here near Disneyland. So I wanna invite you to join me on a type of Mr. Toad's wild ride as we explore new ways to move us forward to advance therapies for our sisters and brothers with rare diseases. So now I'd like to invite you to listen to the videotaped remarks of my good friend, Eric Dubai, Dubai the CEO of Trevere Therapeutics, and then hear from Senator Klobuchar, Senator Wicker, and Representative Butterfield. As we prepare to observe Rare Disease Day 2022, it is an honor to join all of you in the rare disease community at this very important event. I am grateful to stand virtually with fellow leaders today and recognize the passion and resilience of rare disease advocates across the country. For those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, I'm Eric Dubay, President and CEO of Trevere Therapeutics. We're a biopharmaceutical company exclusively focused on identifying, developing, and delivering life-changing therapies to people living with rare disease. We are proud to be in Rare for Life. And as we travel this path together with you, we are driven by the urgent need for treatment options for rare disease patients and families, many of whom reside within our own employee community. Only people living with rare disease can tell the story of what it really means to have a rare condition, the challenges, the heartache, and importantly, the hope and triumphs too. Key decisions are being made this year on critical issues that affect every single one of us, and your stories will help shape our national policy. I am grateful to every one of you for helping make a difference. There's ample good news to share today, 
Congressional leaders seem to be closing in on an agreement to ensure access to telehealth, something so important for reducing family anxiety and draining travel costs. The Cures 2.0 legislation, which includes important provisions expanding genetic testing, and the FDA Rare Disease Center of Excellence in the STAT Act could be considered later this summer. A landmark study was released recently calling for all stakeholders to work together and modernize the newborn screening system in America, something that is so long overdue and could potentially prevent countless deaths and delays to diagnosis. Your voice could make a real difference on all of these issues. And I wanna thank Every Life Foundation for leading the way. As we gather during Black History Month, I wanna thank Linda Blount and the Rare Disease Diversity Council for their work over the last year. Over 200 organizations and individuals, rare disease experts, health and diversity advocates, and industry leaders are now members of the RDDC and are working together to alleviate the disproportionate burden of rare disease on communities of color. We are proud to have played a role in the creation of the RDDC and know there is important work ahead. For example, this summer, Congress is considering ways to address the gaps of diversity in clinical trials, and that includes rare disease clinical trials as well. With the RDDC and like-minded colleagues leading the path forward, we can make a great stride in this critical area. At the same time, we also have challenges on our doorstep. Congress is considering eliminating the orphan drug tax credit in many circumstances, arbitrarily giving some patients incentives while denying them to others. This will not help our community when 95% of rare diseases still have no treatment. The accelerated approval pathway, so critical in ensuring access to life-saving medicines is under intense scrutiny and there is a real need for policymakers to understand what it means to the rare disease community. Again, your voice could make a real difference. I am grateful for everyone taking time out of their busy lives to participate. Rare Disease Week brings us together with our leaders in the Rare Disease Caucus. In particular, I wanna thank House Co-Chairs, Mr. Butterfield and Mr. Villarakis for going to bat for so many rare disease patients particularly those living with rare kidney diseases who have been overlooked for far too long. But we are so fortunate to have many great champions in Congress. So without further ado, we will now hear from our Rare Disease Caucus leaders. Hello to all my friends attending today's briefing on accelerating the pathway to approval. As rare disease legislative advocates, you're leading the way helping to find therapies, treatments, and cures for rare diseases, and working to connect patients with those advances. As you know, there are nearly 7,000 known rare diseases affecting almost one in 10 Americans. That's about 30 million people, roughly half of whom are kids. But only about 5% of rare diseases have a treatment that has been approved by the FDA. We know these patients, we've met them, we know their stories. I'm thinking about Abby Hauser of Chanhassen, Minnesota. She grew up with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, or EDS. You know what it is, a rare genetic connective tissue disorder that causes chronic pain, frequent bruising, abnormal scarring, joint degeneration, and dislocations. But that hasn't stopped Abby from thriving. She ran and completed the Chicago Marathon. For the past decade, she's been a volunteer counselor at the Muscular Dystrophy Association's summer camp. In college, she worked to make fitness and sports fully inclusive for people with disabilities and chronic illnesses. And we think about the Olympics today and we think about all those incredible stories of our Paralympic athletes. We know that there are incredible work of making things possible that are seemingly impossible. And like so many of you, Abby, she serves as an advocate, expressing her vision of a world in which every rare disease has a viable and effective treatment, a world where research gives everyone a chance to fight, no matter how rare their disease. You're all here because you know everyone deserves that chance, and federal funding for basic and translational research is essential. That's why I have fought to increase support for National Institutes of Health and medical research funding, 
Last year, we included a $1.25 billion boost for NIH. The sixth year in a row, it has received an increase. That funding is an important start, but more must be done. Along with Senator Wicker, I lead bipartisan legislation like the Benefit Act, which gives patients and their families a better seat at the table when the FDA is reviewing new treatments. And we also lead the Speeding Therapy Access Today Act, or the STAT Act, to accelerate development of therapies across the spectrum of rare diseases and help improve patients' access to them. Both of these bills are important steps to making sure every patient gets a fighting chance. I'll close with a quote from Abby. She once said, I refuse to be defined by the genetic mutations that have weakened the collagen holding my body together. My body will always be unstable and fragile, but my limitations do not determine who I am. I'm confident that together we can accomplish some truly remarkable things. We will develop therapies, treatments, and cures. We will save lives, and we will not let limitations determine all that we can achieve when we work together. So thank you for bringing your voices to the Hill. I'm glad to be your partner in Washington, working across the aisle to help patients with rare diseases get the care they need. Keep up the great work. Thanks, everyone. Hello, I'm Senator Roger Wicker from Mississippi. I'm glad to join you in our hard work treating, and we hope one day, ending rare diseases. Congress has an important role to play in our national effort to fight rare diseases. With the help of our industry, nonprofit, and government partners, we're working hard to help the millions of Americans afflicted by a rare disease. Our challenge is not a small one. More than 25 million Americans struggle with rare diseases, and they need the excellent work that all of you are doing to help them. One way we have addressed the persistence of these diseases is through legislation. Although the FDA has greenlit more than 800 drugs and other treatments for rare diseases, there are still millions of Americans who remain without options to alleviate their conditions. Last February, I introduced the Benefit Act alongside my fellow Rare Disease Caucus co-chair, Senator Klobuchar. This critical bipartisan legislation would prioritize the role of patients in the drug approval process, tailoring FDA decisions on therapy proposals to reflect the concerns of patients. The bill would also reform the FDA's risk-benefit framework, an important element to approvals for new pharmaceuticals. I also partnered with my friend Senator Klobuchar on the STAT Act last year. This measure would take a major step in reorienting FDA goals toward developing cutting-edge drugs at a faster pace while also improving patient access to therapeutics. The Rare Disease Center of Excellence, a proposed feature of this bill, would help in leading the charge on such reforms. With Rare Disease Day ahead on February 28th, there is an opportunity to bring even greater awareness to this cause. I intend to keep pressing forward in this effort. Another way we can directly advance the fight against rare diseases is through incentivizing and supporting the work of our medical research community. There are thousands of scientists at places like National Institutes of Health working relentlessly to find breakthrough, life-saving cures and treatments. And when we as legislators commit to the serious investment in the NIH, we are providing our country's best and brightest the tools they need to work for a better tomorrow. Each dollar counts and consistent committed efforts from Congress add up in our fight to search for creative solutions to the more than 7,000 rare diseases in the United States. There are great challenges ahead, but the gains we have made hold the promise of an even greater breakthrough to come. Thank you. Greetings. I am U.S. Congressman G.K. Butterfield, proudly representing North Carolina's first congressional district. Let me thank you for participating in today's briefing on the accelerated approval pathway at the Food and Drug Administration. 
This issue is so very important to me. I serve as the co-chair of the Congressional Rare Disease Caucus, and I'm also the co-chair of the Childhood Cancer Caucus. Over the years, I've met with patients and families and caregivers, and their message has always been clear. They say if we want to combat rare diseases, we must increase our investments in research and expand and encourage participation in clinical trials and create incentives for companies to develop the next generation of treatments and cures and make sure that patients have access to these drugs once they are approved. Last Congress, <clears throat> I introduced the Creating Hope Act, which incentivizes the pharmaceutical industry to develop drugs for children, children with cancer and rare diseases, and to do that through a priority review voucher program at the FDA. And so thanks to advocates like you, this program was extended for four more years. This Congress, I teamed up with my rare disease caucus co-chair, my friend Gus Galarakis from Florida, to champion H.R. 1730, the Speeding Therapy Access Today Act, or the STAT Act, as we call it. The FDA does fantastic work, but we believe the reforms in the STAT Act will help the agency better understand rare diseases and ultimately will increase the rare disease pipeline. And so I'm grateful, so very grateful for your advocacy and dedication to this vitally important cause. Please know that you have an advocate in Congress, and I will, I will continue to be your champion in this fight. And so thank you again to all of you for participating today. As we prepare to observe Thank you for those opening remarks from uh, members of Congress and for uh, Eric Dubé. And, and let me turn now uh, to some opening remarks from, uh, from me, and, and then we'll turn to our other panelists. Uh, first, uh, I want to say on the next slide that, you know, our, that this is a very unusual year. Not only is today, as I called out, a rare day in being 2-22-22, but this is also a landmark year. It's 30 years since FDA published its accelerated approval regulations. It's 25 years since the Congress codified accelerated approval in the uh, FDA Modernization Act. And the accelerated approval concepts predate both the regulation and the statute because as I mentioned earlier, it was the creative genius of the FDA that gave birth to the accelerated approval pathway in response to the urgent AIDS crisis. The approval of AZT, the first drug for HIV in 1987 and others during this period showed how accelerated approval could be effective. Um, FDA quickly after the 1987 approval of the first AIDS drugs, AZT, then began to prioritize review and talk about these FDA internal procedures in its staff manual guide in 1988. On the next slide, you'll see that the, the number of AIDS deaths increased dramatically yearly from 1981, the first year through 1995, speaking at about 50,000 Americans losing their lives to AIDS. Um, and what happened in the mid-1980s that, that changed this? Well, <clears throat> I mentioned already that AZT was the first drug approved in 1987. Then there were other accelerated approvals of lamivudine and indifinir in 1995 and 1996 that led to a three-drug cocktail so that the virus couldn't create resistance to the, in a, to the treatment. And it was that three drug antiretroviral cocktail that, that kind of transformed AIDS from a death sentence to a chronic condition. That's how critical accelerated approval was. It was created by FDA, but it was codified by Congress. So let's look at the next slide. The, the next slide shows that maybe 
These first early approvals do not have to be the best drug in order to encourage development in that field. I've already walked you through a little bit about AIDS, how that we, we came up with the first approval in 1987, but in very short order, and that's why by 1995, we had a three drug cocktail aided by two other accelerated approval drugs, so that now there are more than two dozen better drugs across six different drug classes that really has transformed AIDS and made it a chronic condition, not a death sentence. The very first drug that was approved outside of the realm of AIDS and cancer through the accelerated approval pathway was the first drug for multiple sclerosis. I had the honor of being involved with that one. And that was an approval that Janet Woodcock still talks about today, often publicly, because it was a game changer. It was an approval in 1993, and many people criticized it because they said, we don't know that it really meets the substantial evidence of effectiveness standard. It's, it's the first approval of accelerated approval outside of AIDS and cancer. Maybe, you know, we shouldn't be doing that. So there were a lot of questions raised, but what happened? Just like after the initial approval of AZT and it opened the floodgates to more antiretroviral drugs, same thing happened in MS. Although there was an initial question sometimes about whether the FDA was wise to use the accelerated approval for the beta seron, there are now more than a dozen multiple sclerosis drugs looking at several different targets. I had a hand too in a controversial, another controversial drug in 2016 when FDA approved the first drug for uh, DMD, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And when that happened, you know, many people question that. But look, today, in the short time between 2016 relative till now, we have four more DMD drugs approved across two different drug classes. So when we look at the, the approval of Adjahelm, the Alzheimer's disease, uh, the first disease-modifying Alzheimer's uh, drug therapy, when I look, because of I've been around for a while, I can draw on history and what I've seen. And when I look across that, you know, I think that history kind of suggests that what's going to happen is we're going to see that adjuhelm approval is going to open the way to other disease modifying Alzheimer's therapies that might be far better than adjuhelm. So the, my bottom line from the perspective of history with accelerated approval is that the accelerated approval might stimulate development in a medical field that can be a regulatory and statutory innovation that's gonna benefit patients. And what it's going to do by shining a light in that area of need, and then creating a pathway that opens the floodgates to others among us. So let's look at the next slide. So what it tells me is that these 30 years of the FDA approving drugs under accelerated approval, what does it teach us? That the first drug, in a therapy for a, a disease that has no treatments, that first drug does not need to be perfect for it still to represent a watershed moment in addressing the needs of those suffering with that condition. So the first drug might only be a glimmer of the brighter days to come. The next slide, please. So, what we have with accelerated approval is that it's shown that with AIDS and cancer, that it's a unique and well-tailored pathway in those two areas, but it's also a guide that's a pathway outside of the traditional routes to approval. The problem, the next bullet, the second bullet I have on the slide is that the problem is that rare diseases are not like HIV and cancer. With HIV and cancer, the surrogate that is reasonably likely to predict benefit is pretty clear. It's looking at like HIV RNA load in AIDS. It's looking at does a, a tumor shrink, which never happens. So it makes it pretty simple. But in rare diseases, the challenges are greater because in rare diseases, you have smaller patient populations. Often you have unique genetic origins. You have very heterogeneous symptomatology manifestations. And there are challenges for selecting that surrogate, unlike in the case of AIDS and cancer. So it's more difficult to apply accelerated approval in the arena of rare diseases. Yet, yet, 
Rare diseases are even more deserving, in my opinion, of access to accelerated approval because rare diseases are just as serious and life-threatening. And 50% of the time, those who are affected with rare diseases are our children. And, and finally, I wanna say no one among us should be condemned to have no available therapy due to the sheer bad luck that they have a rare genetic disease rather than a prevalent disease. You know, research on common and prevalent diseases is more likely to occur and it's more likely to be able to meet the regular traditional standards for approval. Next slide. The rare diseases need their own unique statutory standard for approval. And what I mean by that is that accelerated approval is great and we need to protect it and strengthen it. And you're gonna hear from Dr. Ellis Unger later and, and also from Pat Furlong that both of them say something that, as I said, I've been involved since the very beginning of accelerated approval. I'm hearing the two of them say something from a patient perspective and from the perspective of a very senior, recently retired FDA drug official, they're both saying the same thing, that maybe we can help define what is reasonably likely to predict. Maybe we can define that in a way so that we strengthen this pathway and make it more available to rare disease therapy innovations. So I applaud what you're going to hear from Ellis and Pat later. And I think we should do everything we can to protect and strengthen the accelerated pathway. But I'm also saying that there's a need beyond that. And why do I say that? that about one third of all the rare disease therapies that FDA has approved, that they don't meet the traditional standards for approval, nor the accelerated approval standards for approval. There's the exercise of what has been called flexibility. And I have been maybe the unwittingly kind of, I created the evidentiary standard for explaining the FDA's application of flexibility for rare diseases with the 2012 paper that I authored. But, you know, flexibility, that's the current solution that people point to, but there's a problem with it. Let's look at the next slide. The problem with flexibility and relying upon that and say, you know what, we can solve the problem of developing therapies for rare diseases by just having the FDA exercise flexibility and the FDA will know what that means and when to apply it. The problem with that I've seen since I articulated that standard 10 years ago, another milestone in 2012, is that things change. There's a loss of institutional memory in the FDA. There's attrition, there's personnel changes. So that if you start developing a therapy, things could change underneath you. And so that kind of subjective application of flexibility can suddenly take a dramatic change. There's differences between the FDA review divisions. And so some people might say, well, how come that can happen in that division and not in the FDA review division I am? So it's very unpredictable. So while the core principles of FDA's application of flexibility have been vital to the approval of many, many rare disease therapy, and I'm so grateful for the agency exercising that scientific and clinical judgment and exercising flexibility, yet I think that those principles of other new ways to approach road rare diseases exist today. And let me just list a few of them that Cong Congress and congressional staffers you can consider. Like there's the emer emergency use authorization we've seen used for COVID, which instead of looking at substantial evidence effectiveness, looks at whether the known and potential benefits outweigh the known and potential risks a different standard. There's the animal rule, which we apply now for things like anthrax and bioterrorism. Maybe that can be used for ultra, ultra rare diseases. When there's maybe only 100 Americans with a condition, you can't organize a clinical trial that's going to show statistical significance with 100 unless you have a pure cure, and, and that's very rare. You, you can embrace the use of natural histories as an external control more than is allowed today. You can look at confirmatory evidence looking at mechanistic information. The EMA might have some examples for us, like they have a conditional marketing authorization. They all also have something called excep exceptional circumstances. We can look to them and see if we can model something that might be akin to that. And we can look at 
like a global statistical test, which are one type of innovative statistical method like Bayesian, but the global statistical test allows for efficient holistic use of all available evidence. And we can look, speaking of evidence, of real world evidence. So there are lots of ways for those in Congress to look to create a possible new firm statutory framework rather than being left to something that's very uncertain and is subject to a lot of subjective judgment in terms of how to apply it. Next slide. So rare diseases today, I think, need modern champions for patients, for Americans with rare diseases. People like I work with and knew, like Senator Orrin Hatch and Congressman Henry Waxman, that were the two fathers of the 1983 Orphan Drug Act. Our sisters and brothers with rare diseases need Congress to work with FDA, patients, researchers, industry, to understand better what has worked and what will work for developing rare disease therapies. And then Congress can codify those lessons into new predictable, standards to guide and accelerate the approval of new therapies for rare diseases. My last slide, please. So in conclusion, I just want to say that patients, developers, and FDA find themselves somewhat in this kind of flexibility fog bank. People talk about it, but nobody knows quite what it is. And it's very ill-defined and hard to know when to apply, even if you could define it. So Congress needs to create a new reliable, dependable, certain statutory framework to help clear this flexibility fog bank. And I ask then members of Congress, and I ask the staff persons, you know, who among you in the Rare Disease Congressional Caucus will answer the cries of our sisters and brothers in need of a new statutory framework to answer their longing for new treatments for their rare diseases? Thank you. And let me now turn to our panel and let them make a statement. First, we're gonna to turn to Dr. Unger and you'll notice that we're not gonna take time having me introduce them because each one of their title slides gives background. So Dr. Unger, we'll turn to you first. Thank you very much, Frank. I'd like to thank the uh, Every Life Foundation and, and you, Frank, as well for inviting me to speak today. It's the first time I've given a non-FDA talk in uh, 25 years. So we'll see how it goes. Um, next slide. Um, I have to be a little bit careful here as a, as a recent retiree from the government, uh, FDA, I'm not allowed to um, ask the government to take any particular course of action, uh, whether it's Congress or the IRS or uh, uh, anyone. So I'm, I'm not making uh, suggestions, I'm just, talking, rendering some opinions and uh, explaining some problems. So I'll have, I'll, I'll, I'll highlight the problems, but I won't have any solutions for today. Thanks, next slide, please. So um, I'm gonna give you a little background on accelerated approval. I suspect many of you know this, but there are probably some listening who, who don't um, understand what accelerated approval uh, really is, what it was meant for. Um, as, as Frank said, it was a stroke of genius. Um, I, would, I would say it was an important and a much needed invention. And I'll, I'll lay it out like this. Imagine that there's a liver disease that's uniformly fatal without a, a transplant. And uh, the disease causes few symptoms or limitations until late in the disease. So there aren't a lot of symptoms that one can measure. And the disease is common. So thousands of US patients require a liver transplant every year in order to prevent death. And so a reasonable clinical trial would assess time to liver transplant or death because that's the endpoint that uh, we uh, would actually care about. But now imagine that the same disease exists, but it's rare. Or the disease is fairly common, but it's slowly progressive. So the transplants and deaths don't occur very often, okay? So a trial to assess time to liver transplant or death might take 15 years to complete because you just don't see a lot of deaths and you don't have a lot of liver transplants. And in that scenario, it's not feasible to run a trial uh, with clinical endpoints because the endpoints don't occur very often, either because there are few patients or because the disease progression is slow or perhaps both. 
And so now you see the, the purpose of the accelerated approval pathway. So the approval is based not on, you know, how many people need a liver transplant or die, but it's based on some surrogate endpoint. Uh, in this case, it would be some type of biomarker. And that would be the way to uh, get a drug approved uh, without waiting the 15 years that it would take to complete the trial. Next slide, please. So there are certain criteria that are required uh, for accelerated approval. First, it has to be a serious condition. Uh, the condition can be rare, but rarity is not a requirement. It doesn't have to be rare. We saw an accelerated approval for Alzheimer's disease uh, recently. That's not a rare uh, disease. Um, the drug has to provide a meaningful advantage over available therapy. Um, and the drug has to demonstrate an effect on an endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. Reasonably likely are the critical uh, words um, in that statement. And then post-marketing confirmatory trials have been required to verify and describe the anticipated benefit. And the trial must be completed with due diligence. I've used the word um, clinical benefit here, and I'll also use the phrase um, clinical endpoint. And anything that's clinical means in, in terms of the way FDA looks at it, that it measures how patients feel, function, or survive. It's a, it's a direct measure um, that that has an impact on the patient, not a, a laboratory test. Uh, next slide. So uh, there are two types of accelerated approval. I, I call them two flavors. <clears throat> the first flavor is the surrogate endpoint. So the surrogate endpoint is not a clinical benefit, but it's deemed reasonably likely to predict a clinical benefit. And that would often be a laboratory marker, some biomarker possibly. And the second flavor, which is used much less uh, frequently, is an intermediate clinical endpoint. So it's a clinical endpoint, but it's measured at an earlier time point. So when it's deemed important to assess the effects of a drug on irreversible morbidity or mortality, a clinical endpoint that could be measured earlier than irreversible morbidity mortality that is reasonably likely to predict an effect on later morbidity, mortality, or other clinical benefit can be used. And I'm not gonna say much more about that because it, it really uh, has limited applicability uh, for rare diseases. Uh, next slide, we're gonna talk about the first flavor. Now, accelerated approval can be withdrawn by the agency. Uh, the FDA can withdraw the approval of a drug or an indication for a drug approved under the accelerated approval pathway if, for example, a trial required to verify the predicted clinical benefit fails to verify such benefit. If other evidence demonstrates that the product is not shown to be safe or effective under the conditions of use, the applicant fails to conduct the uh, required post-approval trial uh, of the drug with due diligence. Um, and those are reasons why the agency can withdraw an accelerated approval, but withdrawal of drugs and indications um, it's been exceedingly rare outside of oncology. Um, and so when you talk about accelerated approval, you actually kind of have to divide the world into oncology and non-oncology. Oncology uses the accelerated approval pathway quite frequently, and it's, it's well honed. Um, but outside of oncology, um, it's not used as frequently. Um, and there have been some issues. Next slide. What's the standard of evidence for accelerated approval? Well, drugs granted accelerated approval must meet the same statutory standard for effectiveness as those granted traditional approval. Substantial evidence based on adequate and well-controlled clinical investigations. So the legal requirements are the same, and yet there's widespread misperception that the standards for accelerated approval are lower, that the bar is lower. And I saw some comments in the chat earlier uh, about how this was uh, accelerated approval with some lower standard or some you know, secondary approval pathway. And that's not the case. In, in both types of approval, traditional approval and accelerated approval, you must have substantial evidence based on adequate and well-controlled clinical investigations. Next slide. The question comes up, you know, why do people have this perception? Um, well, even if every accelerated approval was free of controversy, uh, there are problems. And um, 
I tried to summarize the main ones in this slide. First of all, FDA has a lot of difficulty withdrawing drugs and indications when clinical benefit is not verified in the confirmatory study or when a company hasn't conducted the confirmatory study with due diligence. And you might say, you know, why is that? Well, first of all, um, when a study is done and the study is negative, a negative study doesn't prove that the drug is not effective. Um, it's very difficult to prove a negative. Um, and one can always question the adequacy of the study. Oh, well, the study was negative, but they enrolled the wrong patients, or they should never have enrolled patients who had this, or the endpoint was wrong, um, or the assumptions were wrong, something was wrong. Um, but that doesn't prove that the drug is not effective just because you have a negative study. Um, second of all, there are always patients who believe the drug's beneficial and they will fight uh, against removal of the drug. They will camp out at the FDA and explain why the drug should not be uh, withdrawn from the market because the drug is keeping them alive. Um, so there's that. Um, third, a hearing is required, a public hearing. And that's an investment of considerable FDA resources. So for all of these reasons, uh, we and more, we haven't seen uh, withdrawal of uh, uh, drugs that were approved via accelerated approval. Next slide. Well, here's where uh, <laughs> I'd like to spend a little time. And uh, uh, Frank alluded to this. So, you know, what does reasonably likely mean? Reasonably likely is a critical phrase. It's inevitably a matter of judgment. I will say that. It's a matter of judgment. But, you know, it's not that difficult to get a sense of what one means when one says reasonably likely. First of all, it doesn't mean definitely. It doesn't mean that it's plausible or possible. It means reasonably likely. So uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about this when I was at the FDA. I mean, what does reasonably likely actually mean? I mean, what does it mean when rain is reasonably likely? And if you're living in DC, rain is reasonably likely today. Uh, I closed my window, it may be already raining, <laughs> which case it's definite, but at any rate, uh, it's supposedly reasonably likely. So what does that mean? Is it a 50% chance of rain or 60 or 70, 80, 95? What does that mean? Um, and you know, there are a lot of ways to interpret uh, reasonably likely, but it, it can be translated uh, into some you know, mathematical probability. I'm gonna say just for the sake of this talk that when we say reasonably likely, we're saying a 70% likelihood. Um, that's kind of what it means to me. And I've, I've espoused this principle to others and they kind of shake their heads when I say 70%. They say, yeah, that, that, that sounds good. Uh, next slide. So we'll use that for this discussion. So if it means 70%, that would mean that the FDA is willing to be wrong initially about the efficacy of drugs approved under accelerated approval 30% of the time. So we basically say, you know, it's reasonably likely that that the, uh, you know, your surrogate endpoint, your findings on the surrogate endpoint uh, prove that the drug um, has clinical benefit. <clears throat> but you, you could be, in, we could be incorrect. And if reasonably likely means 70%, it means there's a 30% chance that the drug is not effective. Okay, so that means that 30% of the drugs given accelerated approval for them, uh, you know, the clinical benefit will not be verified and it follows that we should expect that ultimately 30% of these drugs will be withdrawn, right? Because reasonably likely means there was a 70% chance a drug uh, would, would cause a clinical benefit. Now, if reasonably likely meant 90%, okay, and only 10% of, of drugs were withdrawn, then I would say the standard for accelerated approval would be too high. We don't want 90% certainty. Uh, that a drug is going to, uh, uh, you know, impart clinical benefit because we, we want a lower threshold. We want to be able to approve more drugs. We want to take more chance, take more risk of being wrong, okay? Because patients, uh, you know, with diseases, you know, that are, have drugs that are approved for accelerated approval, they want to be, uh, you know, they want to take more chance of, of being wrong. They're willing to accept the possibility of being wrong more than 10% of the time. So it might behoove us to make it easier for FDA to remove these drugs when clinical benefit is not confirmed. I guess the point is that, you know, we don't see 30% of 
of drugs given accelerated approval, we don't see 30% of drugs being withdrawn. We don't even see 10% of them being withdrawn, probably. Frank would actually have the numbers. Um, but I doubt that it's, uh, that it's 10%. So the point is that very few of these drugs are withdrawn. And so either there's something wrong um, with our ability uh, to withdraw the drugs, or the standard is too stringent. We're, we're, we're trying to be too certain before we approve the drugs, one or the other, or some combination of both. Next slide. Another problem is, um, you know, companies don't necessarily uh, pursue those um, post-marketing confirmatory studies with due diligence. Um, the fact of the matter is that once a company gains uh, accelerated approval of their drug, they have little incentive to conduct confirmatory trials. Um, I know of one company that uh, said on their website they were making $300 million a year off of the drug that got approved under accelerated approval. Um, why should they be in a hurry to do the confirmatory study? What do they have to gain? Not much. Um, so they might drag their feet. And they also recognize that, you know, based on history, FDA is not very likely to remove these drugs from the market. Um, so there are problems. And I, uh, I, I have some ideas in my mind, but I'm not allowed to uh, say what they are um, because of my uh, recent retirement. So I'll only say that uh, there are a lot of people who are interested in making potential changes to accelerated approval. Again, I think accelerated approval was a great invention, um, but it, you know, it could be improved. And I won't say more except to uh, stay tuned uh, in this space. And again, I thank you very much for inviting me and I thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you much, Ellison. I'd now like to turn to uh, Dr. G.K. Raju, the chairman and CEO of Light Pharma. Uh, G.K.? Hi, thank you. Thanks, Frank. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. So uh, my name is G.K. Raju, and I've been working uh, on examining regulatory uh, decision makings over time. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I'm going to do today is to give some early uh, messages uh, from this study that we're doing for the uh, Every Life uh, Foundation on expediting treatments for rare diseases in the 21st century. Um, as we uh, examine uh, the uh, rare diseases and we look at the um, orphan drug designations and approvals, uh, one of the thing that stands out on this chart uh, is that the, both the designations and the approvals are growing over these last four decades uh, since the uh, Often Drug Act. And that's a great sign. Uh, it's an indication uh, that they have increased several fold over the last four decades, an indication of intent, investment, and prioritization. Next slide, please. Given these designations and the approvals, uh, what kind of expedited programs are these uh, often drugs uh, using? And what it shows here uh, in terms of the two bars is that a large fraction of these often drugs do use the expedited uh, programs. And in most cases, uh, they use at least one expedited pathway, confirming again that uh, the system and the expedited programs are being utilized for such rare diseases. Next slide, please. Now we talked about regulatory flexibility and uh, Frank talked about regulatory flexibility. Um, when you looked at the study of regulatory flexibility that uh, Frank did, uh, and we look at that over time, uh, what he found was that the FDA consistently demonstrated regulatory flexibility uh, over time. What uh, we show in this slide is that the FDA also demonstrated regulatory flexibility across different disease areas. So the FDA has attempted and demonstrated that it is flexible in making decisions uh, about rare diseases. And that's quite commendable as Frank mentioned. 
if you were to look at uh, these two um, these these two colors in the bars of regulatory flexibility, one is administrative flexibility, which is more part of the system, or case by case flexibility, which is you know you know much more uh, you know a, a discretion of the uh, reviewer and their supervisors. You find a, a significant number of case by case flexibility. Uh, and particularly so uh, for the rare inbound errors of metabolism. So again, uh, the FDA has demonstrated uh, to be able to make these decisions uh, as individuals and as part of a review process to make an interpretation and apply their scientific judgment. Next slide, please. An important thing uh, about the FDA is not only do they make decisions, but they uh, have to explain their decisions. And there is a benefit risk framework that has been developed that allows them to communicate their benefit risk based decisions. And an expectation is that uh, they will incorporate uh, and communicate the extent to which they are incorporating patient perspective in their decisions. Shown on the left is a diagram uh, that shows that they are doing that uh, when you look at it in terms of the patient experience data and the tables in their medical reviews, examining these medical reviews uh, over time shows that at least 90% of the time they are using and referring and including patient experience data in their reviews. In terms of um, the content uh, of their inclusion, uh, among the clinical outcomes assessments you see on the right, that the most frequent are the patient reported outcomes. Again, evidence that patient reported data is being included in these reviews. Often not what clear, however, is that it's not clear how this patient input is being incorporated into their benefit risk assessment and decision-making. One, when you, this is not only about the decision, but it can be uh, also about the communication of the decision. When you explain and review the actual medical reviews, it is not always clear how this patient perspective is incorporated into the benefit risk assessment itself and the final decision. Next slide, please. Here uh, is a graphical depiction of the use of the accelerated approval pathway over time. Uh, and you can see on the left, uh, the um, um, HIV approvals starting early, and you can see that they plateaued out in doing so, making a huge difference for HIV patients. And following, you can see multiple curves on the right of much more recent since then, on multiple oncological diseases where the accelerated approval pathway has been used. Again, you can see that it doesn't have to be used forever. It enables a field to go forward in many cases. HIV was explained. Similarly, you can think about the GLEVAC experience with CML where it, it moved forward the whole uh, CML disease area within oncology. Next slide, please. And it's important to highlight that it's not just about that first approval. That first approval lays the foundation for a platform effect, a platform effect demonstrated here in this chart where the first approval, where the surrogate marker might be quite imperfect as Frank mentioned, but it lays the foundation for all the improvements that move a whole disease area forward. And we've seen that uh, happen in multiple oncological disease area, areas. And again, in the slide, I show approvals, but it's not just about approvals and treatments, it's about lives. And that's what is a consequence that's enabled by this pathway and enabled by these decisions and these treatments. Next slide, please. If we uh, now compare oncological uh, disease approvals and the use of their pathway versus all others, as both Frank and uh, Anga mentioned, they are different in many ways. You will see that on the top, uh, the percentage of 
orphan drug approvals that use the pathway are close to 30%, 28% for oncological diseases. And if you consider all other non-oncological diseases, you will see that they are somewhere close to eight or 9% of orphan drug approvals. Uh, but in summary, uh, the oncological diseases use the A pathway three to five times more frequently than any other diseases. So what can we learn from that? Uh, there's been a success story in HIV, the success story is in oncology. What can we learn about that that's relevant for us in the other disease areas? Next slide, please. First, uh, let's talk about the fact that accelerated approval uh, is the beginning of something that then gets converted. And in the previous uh, two talks, we talked about conversions. When you talk about the HIV, oncological diseases, and all others, you'll see that if you look at the approvals that are at least two years old, because it's not fair to expect a conversion if something that is more recent, you'll see that there are 208 that are at least two years old. And if you look at the table last column on the right, you will see that for HIV, 100% of them are converted. And in the case of oncology, 75% of them are converted and all others, 75% are converted. So while you can look at the middle and say the conversion sometimes takes three to four years to reach half of them to be converted, 75% or more are converted um, as of now when we look at things that are at least two years old. So that gives us some numbers that links to what uh, Dr. Anker was mentioned. So there are 278 approvals, 208 that are at least two years old, and 78% of them are converted. So this process is working, although it can be improved. We can ask and want to be converted sooner, and we can have uh, improvements to implement this pathway. Another thing to keep in mind that there are different diseases. Oncological and HIV diseases, you can see the conversion rate when you get to four years are 50% or more. Others might have lower conversion rates and you can look at it two ways. One is you can say it's taking time, but you can also say for that four years, you've had a chance to try out this disease based on a surrogate marker. And for many of these slowly progressing diseases, this pathway is even more important. However, we've got to learn from the other diseases to make it work for us. Next slide, please. This gives us some indication of why and how it works uh, in the oncological diseases. If you look at the list of approved, recommended, finalized, formal surrogate markers from the FDA, and you look at the orange bars, there's two orange bars, oncology and hematological malignancies. If you just look at the total of those two orange bars, and all the other orange bars, you'll see that all the other orange bars are the same as just the oncological diseases. So everybody else has the same number of surrogate markers that are acceptable uh, in the FDA list as all of oncology. So that's one thing that tells you about uh, their success. The second, if you look at how many of them are connected to different population types. You'll see something like the response rate, which a huge number of population types within oncology that is applicable to. And then you'll see uh, ORR, the response rate, a progression-free survival for the blood cancers. It's also applicable to so many different blood cancers and patient population types with blood cancers. So the general applicability beyond just that indication and that specific population type to so many more population types is another reason why it has been so successful in the oncological area. So for the same number of surrogate markers, 12, there are 85 patient populations it's applicable to for oncological and just 12 for the non-oncology. So that is an important thing that we can learn from. Next slide, please. As a last slide, I thought I would summarize 12 key messages relevant to accelerated approval based on the study that we are doing for the Every Life 
uh, foundation. One, the accelerated approval has been initially leveraged for HIV and later for oncological diseases. In both those cases, the initial approvals have been followed by a huge number of subsequent treatment options for these patients. But it's not just about these treatments. It's about their survival rates and their quality of life. There've been multiple studies on this uh, survival rates. There've been studies on HIV that says there's you know, half a million person years saved and also uh, oncology that is of similar order multiple millions of person years life saved. And that's not counting the quality of life. So huge impact. And the rate at which they use this pathway uh, is three to five times higher for oncological diseases. Uh, there have been 275 accelerated approval path approvals of which 130 are for orphan drugs. Of these, 27 are for non-HIV, non-oncological diseases. So less than 10% of this 278 are non-HIV, non-oncological diseases. Among the list of surrogate markers acceptable, there's the same number for oncology versus all others. On average, each of the surrogate markers for oncological diseases is applicable seven times as many population types as non-oncology. Beyond just HIV and oncology, the accelerated approval pathway has enabled positive health and economic outcomes. You even heard the example of the first multiple sclerosis. So it is working in other areas too, but there are opportunities to improve it in the implementation of the pathways, in the confirmation of trials and giving potentially more teeth uh, for the FDA to be able to withdraw a drug or, or, or make sure that these confirmation trials are done, are done and completed. While those are tactical improvements to implement, there is given the huge health and economic burden associated with rare diseases, the, accelerated approval pathway remains a very important tool for the serious conditions with unmet need. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much, DK. And, uh, and I would like to turn to uh, Tiona Wolfer, who is the CEO of the Sickle Cell Reproductive Health Education Directive. Tiona. Hello. Hi. Thank everyone. Thank the organizers for having me. So I am Tiana Wolford and I am 30 years old living with sickle cell disease genotype SS. Um, so just a little bit of background about my story. About 11 years ago, I actually had a bone marrow transplant, which is the most invasive thing you can do to try to cure yourself from sickle cell. And um, I have since then rejected the transplant and now have issues with my bone marrow and I also still have sickle cells. So like our most researched drug hydroxyurea, I'm very sensitive to that because it has low dose chemotherapy in it. So I am someone that would directly benefit from access and approval of new therapies. Next slide. So here I just have a picture, or that was a collage of individuals living with sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait, just to remind us of why these conversations are so important. Next slide, please. So this is a little bit, I think that we all probably understand that sickle cell is a genetic disease. So individuals are born with it. And basically I think that sickle cell, there's a lot of misunderstandings and misconceptions. And a lot of times when people do think of sickle cell, they just associate it with the disease of pain. And while pain is one of the hallmarks of sickle cell, we have to be mindful that Sickle cell affects anywhere there's blood flow. So any organ, all the vessels. So ultimately sickle cell is a disease of shortened lifespan where the life expectancy is 40, which has come a long way because just 30 short years ago, individuals with sickle cell disease were not living into adulthood. 
Um, another huge burden of sickle cell is fatigue. Like a lot of us develop a high pain tolerance, but because of the severe anemia, because of how quickly our red blood cells die, fatigue is something that can really impact the quality of life, which leads into problems with mental health and isolation. And a lot of times we think about the isolation among adults with sickle cell, but because of a complication that causes delayed puberty in children with sickle cell disease, that concept of isolation can start really early. And then our males with sickle cell, because this is not just a women's health issue, this affects everyone. They deal with something called priapism, which is long and painful erections lasting for hours, even days. And lately there's been a lot more research. So we know that individuals with sickle cell disease because of iron overload from transfusion therapy, from medications and from just simple disease progression and fertility is at risk organ damage, stroke, jaundice. These are just a few of the complications that individuals with sickle cell experience. Next slide, please. So I just kind of wanted to walk everybody through the journey so that they can understand what the sickle cell disease community has been going through since discovery in 1910. Our first approved drug was called hydroxyurea and that was approved in 1997 for the treatment of individuals living with sickle cell disease. However, it had already been an approved drug to treat other disease communities. So then you see that it was almost 30 years before the sickle cell community had any type of disease modifying therapy. So in 2019, we were very grateful because we had Oxbrita and Adaxio both through accelerated approval. And then this, I have this blank because this just represents the future because it's my understanding that there are over 40 disease modifying therapies coming down the pipeline for individuals with sickle cell disease. Next slide. So here I just have some quotes and I have permission to, to share these with you from individuals in the sickle cell community. And they're speaking to how both Oxbrita and Adacvio have changed their lives. So one patient, Natasha says, being on Adacvio has been life-changing. She has not had a crisis in almost a year and a half. Um, another adult patient, I started Adacvio last year. And since being on Adacvio, I've had less hospitalizations. I have more energy and I'm starting to feel like myself again. And then we have Zara and Keisha Weeks, who Zara is actually nine years old, which we know that x just got approval for children under nine years old. So Zara was fortunate enough to participate in the clinical trial. And it's so important that children with sickle cell have access to these disease modifying therapies early because it can really prevent them from dealing with a lot of the deterioration that would happen if left untreated. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, before, can you go back one second? I also have a quote from Jennifer McNary because I wanted to show obviously that accelerated approval not only benefits individuals with sickle cell disease, but families with other rare diseases. So Jen is the mother of a son with Duchenne and they have benefited <clears throat> and accelerated approval has been incredibly important to them. So that just was another quote from somebody who is really dealing with these implications. Next slide, please. So this is just my final take home message. Again, I wanna thank the organizers for having me and thank you guys for taking time to listen to my story. Um, so just the take home messages are that patients cannot afford to wait like any time, any day, any month, any year that a drug is going unapproved is a potential day that somebody is suffering unnecessarily. But I also want us to be mindful that approval does not mean access. And so we have to continue the conversation and continue the work because there's a lot of work that has to be done on the state level to make sure that when we do get these drugs approved, hopefully through accelerated approval, 
we have to do everything we can to make sure they actually end up in the patient's hands. So thank you everyone for listening. Fiona, thank you. This, uh, thank you very much for being courageous and an advocate. Uh, we appreciate it. Turning to another courageous patient warrior advocate, now Pat Furlong, um, a good friend for a long time. She's the CEO and founder of Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy. Pat? Thank you, Frank, and thank you to Every Life and to you as well, Frank, for inviting me here on this very important day of the 2nd of February, 22. Um, it feels quite important to talk about accelerated approval. Next slide, please. So I'd like to just give you a case study in accelerated approval and what we've learned from it and how it has helped our community. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is an X-linked progressive debilitating disease. It has, it's one of the largest genes in the human genome and also uh, one of the largest protein products. So we can talk about 2000 mutations across this gene and hotspots within the gene, but that in no way describes what it's like to have Duchenne muscular dystrophy or for a family to have a young man with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. When we think about progressive loss of function, we're talking about a boy who is born looking quite normal, although might miss his milestones slightly usually improves in terms of refining small and large motor function in the early years between four and seven, but by about eight years old, they're at their peak performance. And so by what we see about age 12 is the loss of the ability to walk. By age 15, the loss of arm function. By age 15, also the need for non-invasive ventilation, especially at night while sleeping. The disease is 100% fatal and the mean age of death is 30. Next slide, please. So while, while we see in Duchenne muscular dystrophy a 30 year progression, what we're also seeing is by the age of 15, most of these young men no longer walk and can no longer lift their hands to their mouth. So this is a slowly progressive disease and we are thrilled and excited for the SMA community with the, with the um, approval of Zolgensma and other, other indications for SMA. And in Zolgensma, if we look at SMA1, those little babies are born really without function and they lose their life by about 48 months. So when we see, or 24 to 48 months. So what we see here with Zolgensma is a Lazarus effect. Those little, those little children who weren't expected to roll over or sit up or speak are doing exactly that. They're rolling over, they're sitting up, some are walking and they're speaking. So it is an incredible Lazarus effect to what we see and we're thrilled for the SMA community. However, in a disease like Duchenne, where it's slowly progressive, we don't have expectations of a Lazarus effect. We have none of those. When we think about how to run trials in a slowly progressive disease, it's hard to look at a clinical endpoint because regardless of what population you choose, whether an ambulatory population or using arm function as an endpoint, it's still very slowly progressing. So we'd have to have trials that exist way beyond 12 or 18 months to really understand the full effect of a drug. So accelerated approval as described by, by um, earlier by Frank and GK and, and Dr. Unger, it's reasonably likely. So that means there's a real chance of something providing benefit to this population and reasonably likely. And if we can look at Dr. Unger's presentation of 70% chance of rain, I'd carry an umbrella. And in this case, accelerated approval really gives us the chance to look at something that is good, perhaps not perfect, but is reasonably good and reasonably likely to show benefit. Next slide, please. So in slowly progressive diseases, what we see as benefit or what we describe as benefit, we look at it in three flavors, essentially. Improvement, but that's what we're all hoping for. But when function is lost, when muscle in our case is gone, you cannot restore muscle, you can't rebuild it. So reversal is, is usually impossible in our disease unless there are other technologies somewhere in the future that enable that. But what we're looking for is slower progression. If we can have more time, if these young men can, and some women can have more time walking, if they can have more time lifting their arm to their mouth, more time breathing, then that closes that gap on what we see as the mean age of death of 30, but the average person at the age of 15 or 16 does not have the ability to lift hand to mouth. So if you could improve that quality into the 20s, it would be amazing. Not a Lazarus effect, but certainly for those who are are diagnosed with Duchenne and their families would be incredible. And I think one of the things that we forget about is stability as benefit. 
In a disease where you're anticipating decline, when you have stability, preservation of function is really, really necessary and important and, and surely means of benefit. I don't think there's a parent or an individual diagnosed with Duchenne who doesn't go to bed every night and wish and pray to whoever they believe in that nothing further, no other muscle cell dies. Next slide, please. So when we think about what is a loss of function to the individual, and, and I venture to say, as, as we look at SMA1 and that's a Lazarus effect, I think we also have to sort of reset ourselves to look at rare progressive diseases and each of these loss of functions as a little death. We have to, and I know that doesn't compare to death itself, but in terms of the individual's loss of function, that does feel like a death to them. Loss of the ability to stand from a seating position means that you can't get up off your chair in school at all. So if there's a fire, someone's going to have to get you off that chair and get you out of the school. The loss of the ability to stand on one foot. Now, I, I think every parent would say, maybe it doesn't even matter, but it does because this is a clear indication of core strength. If you have core strength, then you're less likely to be knocked over in school and fall on the ground and perhaps at risk for a fracture. The loss of ambulation, what does that mean for this individual? It means that he's going to be using uh, an, a wheelchair to do everything in terms of his mo uh, movement. I will agree that it gives them a, more freedom because the risk of falling earlier, but still means, can they get into friends' homes? Can they get into buildings that are not accessible? Can they go up curves that are not accessible? Depends on the city you live in. And the loss of arm function, again, another little death, being unable to lift your hand to your mouth, to have dinner with friends, you'll need to be fed. It means that you can't comb your hair. It means that you don't have privacy. Someone is going to have to help you for all of those activities. And the need for non-invasive ventilation, this means that you're not breathing it well at night and perhaps during the day, depending on your, your um, force vital capacity and your breathing apparatus. But using ventilation means that that piece of equipment then is strapped onto the wheelchair. Again, it limits this person's ability to have access to all the things he or she wishes to do. Next slide. And what do these little deaths mean on a family when there's a loss of function? When there's a loss of the ability to stand, to sitting, to stand from sitting, this means that someone has to help them get off, lift them and get off that, that couch or the chair or whatever. Loss of the ability to stand on one foot. We really worry about these young men falling and fracturing. And fracturing can have a ripple effect of other problems along the way, such as for, uh, uh, fatty embolism and others that really can, that can cause death or hospitalization for sure. Loss of ambulation not only means this person isn't walking, they're using a wheelchair. You're going to have to travel with that wheelchair. So that expense to the family of buying a wheelchair van so that you can accommodate that. So it has this long ripple effect, loss of arm function again. That means your family or some caregiver has to provide that help for you to comb your hair, to go to the bathroom, to have some privacy and to feed yourself. And, and I think one of the things that we have to think about is by the age of 15, most of these young men are going to need a primary caregiver or help, whether that's a family member or whether that's someone brought into the house for every single activity of daily living. That has an extreme effect on families, on their ability to survive together, to thrive together, on the financial requirements, on some of the employment, because often you're going to have to have someone caring. So many times parents or caregivers will, will stop working so that they can take care of this young man who has these needs. Next slide, please. And what is the ripple effect on the field when we get an uh, when we get a um, accelerated approval? It's quite incredible what we have seen. And and Frank mentioned the four approvals that we have, and and perhaps the approval that was controversial, the first approval. But I will say that approval leads to a recognition that there's proof of concept here, that this particular approach is going to work, is useful, it makes sense. So that leads to more research industry competition, more trials and more approvals. So there is a ripple effect on the field. It also says, when my sons were diagnosed, the physician said to me, there's no hope and no help and there'll never be a treatment. Accelerated approval says, this works. You can hit years proof of concept. We know enough about this pathology to be able to target different pathways and slow or halt progression 
music to my ears. So I think the improvement or the ripple effect on a field with an accelerated approval is remarkable. Right now today in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, if we look at when Chris and Pat were here, my two sons, there were no industry sponsors interested in this space. Fast forward to today, we have more, we have about 46 active trials. We have about six companies in looking at gene therapy. We have many more companies looking at, at the mRNA approach in terms of exon skipping or antisense oligonucleotides. And then companies coming in and saying, well, is that heart built to last, which has been our question for a long time. Can we really improve heart function so that if these young men are walking into 30 and hopefully 50 as the lifespan increases, then we are protecting their function and enabling them to have full lives full of function and not worry that they'll fall and fracture. Next slide, please. So what does reasonably likely mean? It means opportunity. It means opportunity to participate in trials, but also to have the opportunity to look at this drug in the context of their life and see what value it has. It means equity. Not everyone can join clinical trials. They might not fit the inclusion criteria. They may not be able to travel there. They may live in a small community and the clinical trial site is far distant from them. So leaving their home and their comfort of home and their trusted environment of healthcare professionals to go to a clinical site at some distance with people they don't know, with a team they are not familiar with, and not the trust that's been established to join a clinical trial, that may not work. So not everyone can join clinical trials. Not everyone has a support system at home to participate. Not everyone has an employer that says, sure, take the time off, however long that takes to participate in a trial. Not every young man wants to leave his school and his regimen that he's used to at home or all of the things that in, are in place in his life at his home. Not everyone has the ability to participate in trials. It means access. It means an access for everyone wherever they live once we get an accelerated approval. It hopefully means preservation of function. And it's about time. Time is the commodity here because we already know the trajectory of this disease really very well. We have multiple uh, natural history studies. The doctors predicted at the day of diagnosis, they tell you what's going to happen at what point. Now we are even more specific about prediction. If the, if the force vital capacity is this, you're gonna need non-invasive ventilation then. If your walking looks like this, in terms of the gait analysis, we can predict you're going to lose function and lose the ability to walk. So we can really predict what you're going to lose in, within what period of time. So reasonably likely to me means that we save time. Accelerated approval means that we save time and lives and function. And I think it's essential and rare disease that we are able to utilize this pathway. I agree. I think Frank has said um, multiple times that I've heard him say is that the first drug does not need to be perfect to be a watershed moment. It's a glimmer of brighter days ahead and indeed spurs innovation and acceleration of therapy development. Next slide, please. So accelerated approval. Uh, patients want safe and effective drugs. I've heard it said long ago, patients will accept anything. I, I disagree. Patients want safe and effective drugs. What they want is to have the experience to utilize those drugs to see the full effect of both their safety and efficacy. Accelerated approval is a pathway that enables real world evidence. How does this child look? And we're talking, and forgive me for all the men online, when we're looking at little five-year-old boys, they're not so good with these <laughs> outcome measures. They're distracted, they don't get it, they don't really wanna do it, and why should they? So this gives us a real world evidence to ask the question, is this drug safe and does it help? Does it preserve function? Does it delay the onset of loss of function? In slowly progressive diseases, this is critical because we can't do trials and no company will be willing to do a trial for three years. And frankly, the rare disease community doesn't want three-year trials. We need these drugs to get out in the environment so that there isn't just a small subset of people with a single outcome measure or primary outcome measure. We need to have an experience given the variability of this disease is what does benefit to look like to you, the individual with this disease? And can we match that up, up against our natural history and say, you're walking in this gate at this rate and therefore you won't lose function or it's unlikely that you'll lose function for five more years, which would be music to our ears. This provides access to people who wait and often wait their lifetime. 
my son Patrick once at eight years old went to a high school, he was at a Catholic high school and he was asked to uh, participate in an auction and he was going to buy the ability to be the, the, um, uh, the coach at a basketball game. He asked me for a blank check and I said, oh my gosh, a blank check, Patrick, what are, you, what are you really looking for? And he said, it's my midlife crisis. And indeed it was, he died at the age of 15. Accelerated approval in rare diseases is the way forward. It is about time, which is the commodity in rare diseases. It's about slowing progression or halting progression because indeed that is benefit and that's what we're looking for. Thank you again. Thank you, Pat. I mean, no matter how many times I listen to Tiona and Pat, I can't help but be moved to tears. Um, as, a, as a fellow rare disease patient myself, they're, they speak for the patient voice in powerful ways. And so I want to thank them. I want to suggest to the, those listening that, you know, within the rare disease community, we sometimes use a zebra as a symbol of rare diseases, because when you hear hoofbeats, don't assume it's a horse. I think, I think you might have heard Pat articulate a new symbol. That is for an umbrella. If you're 70% certain, carry an umbrella. So we might have a new symbol of the rare disease community, thanks to Pat. Now I'm gonna to turn to our last speaker, our cleanup hitter. Uh, so I'm gonna ask Andy Kennedy, who's the head of policy and advocacy for the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases to speak. Uh, Annie? Great, thank you so much to everybody who's been here with us today. Um, and for the community for being a part of this today, I know accelerated approval is something that matters so much to all of us for all of the reasons that our panelists have shared today. Can we go to the next slide? So I'm just going to um, really hit some of the highlights of the key themes that we as a community um, have pulled together and that many of our panelists have underscored today. Can we go to the next slide? So first, it's why accelerated approval works for rare disease, why it matters to our community. As we know, there are an estimated seven to 10,000 rare diseases. And using that 7,000 number, we believe that there are more than 30 million Americans living with rare diseases. In uh, 2020, the Everly Foundation worked with the broad community to establish some real data around the economic impact of living with a rare disease. And in 2019, we found that of 379 diseases that we looked at, that impact was $1 billion. And what's more important to consider is that 60% of that impact were costs incurred directly by families, not direct health costs, but costs that are coming out of the pockets of American families. Of those rare diseases, more than 50% are pediatric onset, and many are rapidly progressing fatal diseases. And fewer than 5% of those disorders have FDA approved therapies. We have a public health crisis in the US of rare disease that deserves the urgency and innovation of the accelerated approval pathway. Next slide. So this is just more of that data that shows that even within the 40% of those direct costs, we spend a lot of time in Washington talking about policies to really uh, target those direct costs, but the cost drivers are not therapies. The cost drivers are inpatient admissions, outpatient admissions, the diagnostic odyssey, which we could do so much about. There is so much more we could be doing to better serve our rare disease community, including protecting and expanding the incentives to develop effective and safe therapies for the rare disease community. Next slide. So let's talk about the scientific rigor of the accelerated approval pathway. And we've heard this spoken to so many times by so many of the panelists here today. That therapy development using biomarkers is not a compromise. And in fact, surrogate endpoints are validated measures that are backed by science. And in many of the diseases in our rare disease portfolio, these surrogate endpoints or these biomarkers can more accurately capture what's happening within our rare diseases. They are closer to the underlying cause of disease and can be tracking the real-time disease progression better than clinical data. And that well-established biomarkers have enabled other pathways such as oncology and HIV, as Dr. Raju so eloquently pointed out, to be transformed. And as um, Dr. Unger showed, that the accelerated approval pathway is subject to the same statutory standards and regulatory rigor as more traditional approval pathways. Next slide. So let's talk about safety. 
The rare disease patient community wants safe products as much as we want effective products. And the safety of rare disease treatments are viewed through the context of the benefit risk framework for each patient population. Pat and Tiana just spoke about the nuances and the um, progression within their respective disease communities. And the FDA takes that into account. They understand the benefit and risk of each patient community as they look at the therapies coming through the pipeline. And the trial outcomes for any of the trials that are considered by FDA are carefully considered and weighed against the known natural history and disease progression. And as actually something that Pat often says, and the certainty of doing nothing. And so when we think about that 70% that's been talked about today, what we do know in rare disease is the hundred. what happens the 100% of the time that we do nothing in our rare diseases. And we also saw data today that showed that more than 75% of products approved for varia, the accelerated approval pathway have been converted to traditional approvals. Next slide. So let's talk about access. Tiana really ended on an incredibly important point that approval does not equal access. And if the products that are approved that are deemed safe and effective for patients with rare diseases don't make it into the hands of the patients who are eligible, this is all for naught. We have some really important evidence that has shown um, that delaying and um, preventing access to patients, first of all, is not ethical. Um, but it is also, we are not causing um, a huge impact on the ecosystem as far as pricing is concerned. So we have evidence that Ken Thorpe and colleagues showed that showed that within the Medicaid setting, drugs approved via the accelerated approval pathway accounted for less than 1% of annual Medicaid spending in 2000, between 2007 and 2018. We must do better to ensure that products that are approved via the accelerated approval pathway make it into the hands of patients. We also cannot have two separate adjudication processes in the US. Once a product has made it through FDA's regulatory rigor and has met the statutory approval standards at FDA, that product must have access and not be subject to an additional adjudication process within the access environment. Next slide. So as a community, we've come together to identify some opportunities to strengthen and protect our accelerated approval pathway that really reflect what we understand about the pathway. Uh, so the first is that we need to support the pri prioritization of resources and collaboration necessary to advance knowledge on rare disease biomarkers and intermediate clinical outcomes. We've seen that for the many rare diseases coming through, we have very limited endpoints, biomarkers, and outcomes that are approved. We need to protect and strengthen the existing incentives for therapeutic development in rare disease, including the orphan drug tax credit, which is an incredibly important life-saving therapeutic development incentive for the rare disease community. As I just spoke to while protecting the statutory role of the FDA, we need to look for opportunities to facilitate earlier payer engagement around the selection and use of endpoints and surrogate biomarkers in clinical studies and regulatory review prior to regulatory approval so that those discussions with payers don't happen at the point of post-market approval. Um, there were discussions to the next point around confirmatory trials. We've seen data around the conversion of products from accelerated approval to uh, traditional approval, but we also need to identify opportunities for confirmatory trial process improvements through more structured and earlier stakeholder engagements in the pre-market setting. We also have to understand how complex conducting clinical trials, uh, confirmatory trials are within rare disease and understand that post-approval randomized controlled uh, confirmatory trials often pose ethical challenges when there is no longer clinical equipoise. So we need to look at um, ways of approaching these clinical trials in a way that is ethical to the rare disease community. And we also need to, based on what we heard today around the 70%, perhaps we're seeing evidence to support more, um, more evidence, more guidance around what is considered reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. Perhaps 70% is an important threshold to be considering. And then we need to enable broader use of real-world evidence to satisfy post-approval confirmatory requirements. 
I think most importantly, what we know is that the accelerated approval is working as intended. It's delivering better health to those in dire need. We must value and protect it for the benefit of all patients where opportunities of accelerated approval have yet to be realized. We need more incentives, more approvals, and more access. Frank? Yeah, I, th thank you very much, Annie. You know, I wanted to thank uh, everyone. I want to start by thanking uh, our co-chairs from the uh, Rare Disease uh, Congressional Caucus, uh, Senator Klobuchar, Senator Wicker. I want to thank Representatives uh, Butterfield and uh, Bill Rockus. And I want to thank all other staff people and all the other congressional uh, staffers who are here listening and uh, participating, because I know it's your leadership that also is very vital. And I want to thank all our panelists. Uh, thank, thank each one of you for participating, for preparing your remarks. Obviously, you spent a lot of time preparing for this, because you know how important this might be to those in the rare disease community. Thank you for lending your voice so that uh, to those people who couldn't be here and would otherwise be without a voice. And, uh, and I wanted to uh, then turn this back uh, to Annie Kennedy for a few uh, housekeeping items as closure. Uh, Annie? Thank you, Frank. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, actually, if you can go back, one of the housekeeping items is that we have a lot of new resources on accelerated approval for those who are interested that just launched today on our website, and that's the URL. Um, and we also join forces with um, PFCD on a Faces of Accelerated Approval campaign. So you can find a lot of that information there on our website. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, also a reminder, please join our networking session and meet all of our exhibitors today from 2.45 to 3.45. We'd love to see you there. Um, this is a really terrific event and the networking events are a really wonderful addition to Rare Disease Week. And the next reminder is I believe our documentary screening is this evening. Um, this is a really powerful documentary um, featuring the Jeffrey Modell story called Do Something. That's tonight from 5.30 to 7.30. And it also begins with a networking opportunity. And the next, um, and again, a thank you to all of our caucus briefing sponsors who um, made today possible. And um, again, a very special thank you to our um, lead sponsor. I think that's the next slide. Um, next slide. Uh, Trevira Therapeutics, and again, to Eric Dubé, who got us kicked off. And we will see you throughout uh, the week for our uh, congressional um, briefings over the next week and our legislative briefings to get you all ready for the Hill next week. So again, thank you to all of our panelists today. Um, the slides from today will be posted on our website um, and the recording will be available. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>